Right, tonight's presentation is implementing open educational resources at ESU. Some of you may be aware of Kemp Library's initiative to offer these OERs or free or low cost educational resources to students and faculty. The library faculty is here to discuss their research and outreach leading up to the implementation of this initiative and how they are working with different departments across campus to provide support for faculty and to create a more positive experience for students. The team includes Megan Smith, the assistant professor and department chair, Allison Wind, assistant professor, and Kelly O'Donnell, instructional support manager. Allison Wind works as the electronics resources librarian at Kemp Library. She graduated from Drexel University School in 2012 with a master's in library and information science. Previous to her per arrival at ESU in 2016, she worked as the Le web services librarian at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine and various public libraries in New York's Hudson Valley. Allison is interested in making all information as accessible as possible to all ESU students through her work with managing Kemp Library's website and Primo Library catalog. Kelly O'Donnell works at East Strasburg University as an instructional support manager. She graduated from here in 2016 with a master's in instructional technology and went on to work um, at ESU supporting faculty primarily with D2L and all their kinds of technology. She is passionate about incorporating technology into the learning process and helping faculty learn new technologies. So I'm going to turn the program over to Allison and um, Kelly. <laughs> for the introduction, we're gonna get started. Um, so again, I'm Allison and this is Kelly, and we're gonna talk to you today about how we implemented OER, or Open Educational Resources, at uh, ESU. And the first thing we're gonna do, if I can get the slide to go. Uh, okay, I will do it. You'll do it, okay. <coughs> so we have a little interactive poll here. So you can text. So get your cell phones Yes, out. get your phones out. For one time. <laughs> <laughs> um, text Kelly O'Donnell 665 to this number. 22333. Yes, what we want to know is what do you think the barriers are to students buying traditional textbooks? Now there's a good mix of people in here, so students and faculty and I'm assuming some staff. So go right ahead and text us why you think there are barriers to students buying traditional textbooks. We'll give you a couple of minutes and my only request, and this is because I used to be a teacher, work safe answers. <laughs> So we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll um, we'll talk about what so we. So after you get. text Kelly O'Donnell and the number, then you can text what your answer is. And this is the first time we've tried this, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, but since I'm the techie person, I needed to add it. What? No, I don't think you have to put a name. Do you have to put a name? No, I'm doing the poll. Oh, you're doing the actual. Okay. Yep. What's showing up is the response? Yes. yes, what's showing up is everybody's responses wow. as we go. Wow, amazing. <laughs> so it's going to make like a word cloud. Okay. And the more you answer a certain, uh, a certain word, it gets bigger. So as everybody can see, money is the biggest right now. We'll give it a couple more answers. <laughs> Unnecessary. Bulky. Coins. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, I'm guessing poor means I'm poor. I can't afford the textbooks. See if we get any other answers. <laughs> you can use them more than one word. Oh, but it's only going to show one or two of them. Yeah. <laughs> Unnecessarily expensive, it could have been. Okay. Yeah. That looks good. So you guys can tell that money, really, a lot of people must have chosen money as the word that they're seeing. Okay. So um, most people answered money as one of the barriers to buying traditional textbooks, and that's definitely um, through our research for making this presentation. 
and implementing OER that that is probably the top reason why students don't buy traditional textbooks. Um, this shows a graph of student debt in relation to credit card debt. So as you can see, student loan debt is just skyrocketing, and it's really surprising if you compare that to just plain old credit card debt. So if students have this exorbitant uh, student loan debt by the time they're graduating, you know they're having a hard time paying for their textbooks. And then this graph shows the increase in textbook prices, and I think the, uh, the yellow line, was that um, inflation? No, it's uh, consumer price index. Oh, consumer price index. Okay, so if you can see, um, back in the early 80s um, to now, there's a huge increase in textbook prices. And there's no plateau. There's no top. We have no idea where it's gonna, going to end if it does. Um, and I believe the next slide, it shows that since the late 70s, college textbook prices have risen more than 1,000%. So um, for example, my father went to school in the 70s in college. And he said he graduated with $3,000 worth of debt. And, <laughs> and I graduated with, after grad school, I, had still, I still have $50,000 worth of debt. And I graduated 12 years ago from undergrad. Yeah. So, um, and obviously, your incomes aren't <laughs> increasing 1,000%. No. You know what I mean? So it's not keeping up with it's that rate. It's not keeping up, no. And actually, textbooks are rising faster than any other um, consumer product right now. So that's kind of insane. So this is an infographic we found. Um, it was from Top Hat, which I believe is like an educational software website mm -hmm. from Canada. Um, so up at the top, you can see uh, the average annual cost of books for a full-time student is about $1,200. Um, and I can tell you from experience, my husband just went back to school and he paid probably about $1,000 for his textbooks this semester. He's an accounting major. So that's pretty accurate. Um, and then what was that, the average cost of a going home for Thanksgiving, $300. So instead of, instead of buying your textbooks, you could get a plane <laughs> ticket to your house and back for Thanksgiving. Um, and again, there's the uh, figure we saw before where the textbooks have increased by 1,000%. 65% of students uh, skipped buying a textbook for their course because it was too expensive. Uh, about 30% of four-year students use financial aid to, pr to uh, purchase their textbooks. And five, about five million students use financial aid to use textbooks, to buy textbooks. So it's expensive. Um, so what's the alternative? So something called OER. Has anybody heard of OER? No, oh, so very little. Oh, yes. Um, so it's open educational resources. Um, so in any of your classes, do any of your professors use textbooks that are free, that are on the site, that are, like yeah. so a few. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, there's something else called alternative educational resources, which is just databases, anything the library owns. So don't get caught up on the wording. Really, this is any free course material that your professor uh, uses or that faculty you guys want to use. This includes you can use videos, you can use calculators, you can use what else do you have, does the library have? Some interesting things, I found the, the term AER, which is Alternative Educational Resources, and it's basically like the entire library could be OER. So you're already paying for the library to purchase things um, to use to supplement your classes. So if the, like for example, we offer um, calculators. So if your professor says you need a calculator, don't buy it, go to the library, check it out. You've saved yourself a hundred bucks on a calculator. Um, for example, databases. We have a lot of databases that have ebooks and um, really relevant uh, information for some of your classes. So y your professor might want to use those so you don't have to go purchase a textbook. You can just go right to the database, find the information you need. Um, we recently subscribed to a new database that has um, plays in it. So they record live, uh, like Broadway plays and plays from England. And instead of your professor saying, here, I want you to go buy this book and we're going to read Romeo and Juliet, you can go to the database for nothing and watch like 10 versions of the play and compare it. So things like that that you might not um, traditionally think as course materials, you'd want to consider as OER. And something I think we're really excited about this semester is the library actually has bought some of the gen ed courses 
textbooks for your courses. So we have some, do you know, I don't know exactly, I don't have the list of which ones, but like maybe if you have like an intro to biology or anatomy and physiology, I think they have, the textbooks are in the library and you can use them. So you can come in and um, scan your pages you need or like just read up your chapter at a time. So we're kind of hoping that if any of the faculty ever have, or if you hear faculty who have extra courses, uh, textbooks for the courses you're currently teaching or next semester, if you have an extra copy, you can donate it to us and we'll put it up on the shelves and then the students can use it. So that's a really good de like deal that we think would help. Um, so why is OER so attractive? This is the one way you as a faculty member can directly affect the student financial aid. You have an impact on this. You can't, no, you know what I mean? Like nobody has control over tuition or fees, but you do have control over this. So it's kind of nice to know that you can help, you can directly impact your student. Um, and um, Kemp, like we said, already has ebooks, calculators, laptops. If you have a question where you're like not sure if maybe the library has it, just give them a call and they'll let you know. And another thing, um, at the end of this presentation, we have a number of how much money that OER has saved ESU students already just from implementing this in, in one semester. So it's a pretty interesting number once we get to the end. Yeah, so thinking <laughs> about what you think we might have just in one semester saved students and start thinking about that. Um, okay, so why is OER beneficial? The other thing that's nice for faculty is I've heard, I don't know if any of you guys have heard this, but you use three or four books, you use little chapters from three or four books, and then your students are buying four books for two, three chapters. OER is really nice because depending on the copyright, you can take those chapters and you can put them together. So you can mix and reuse and like, let's say you want to change something based on your class, you can edit it. So it's nice and it's convenient for you guys. And um, how many times has somebody heard, I don't have my textbook? A million times, right? This will stop that because if you uh, use OER, it's instantly available. First day of classes, students have it. We can post it, I'll talk a little bit later, but on your D2L pages, you can have it right there and the student has access and there's no excuses for that. Um, I don't know if you guys saw the Monday message, of, uh, this was in what, September? Yeah. But um, the president sent out 42% of our students are Pell eligible, which means that um, they're low income. And it's not that they just don't want to buy the textbooks, it's that they literally can't afford to buy the textbooks. We all know that the food pantry was open this semester for a reason, because there's a need. So if students can't afford food, how are we expecting them to buy a $200 textbook? It's not that they're irresponsible and they just want to be like, well, it's, you know, I'm not going to read it. It's that they literally can't afford it. And 65% of students will admit to not buying their books. So we have a huge chunk of students that are at least not buying some of their books that may be mandatory. Out of the 65%, I don't have the statistic on me, but a majority of those students know it could impact their grades. So they're not buying their textbook and they know it'll impact their grade, but they really don't have any other choice. So this is really a beneficial um, textbook or course material that you can um, help the student that way. We've had a lot of students come in the library too and they'll say, oh, I, I share my textbooks with three people in my class. So having something that's available, say, <laughs> online, that people can get to all the time, multiple users can use it at one time, instead of having to come up with a schedule for people to share their print textbook, that's another great reason for um, implementing OER. And um, again, it'll increase your course student satisfaction. Students will yeah, the reviews you have to do at the end of the year, they'll say, hey, I really, really liked this class because I didn't have to spend $200 on my textbooks this semester. Yeah. And I would definitely recommend people take this class because um, I save money. And you're actually going to end up having more students sign up for your classes because word gets around who doesn't use textbooks. And then they're going to be like, oh, you're not using textbooks? I'm going to sign up for that class because, I mean, obviously you're all awesome faculty, but that's like a little added incentive. I don't have to buy a $100 textbook. Um, it's funny that we talk about stories because we've done workshops and things um, on these and one student said that he, it was like, I think it was like a $250 book that he had to buy and there was like four of them sharing it. So by the time he got it, they had created a schedule and he got the schedule where he got it at midnight and he was staying up till like 3 a.m. doing assignments and work and he knew it was affecting his grade, he knew it was affecting his sleep, but he had no other choice. So these kind of things, you know, you kind of directly affect, which is really just awesome, I think. 
And um, I really like the statistic that the cost barrier, I mean, I don't like it, but it's good to see. The cost barrier, this was in the 2000s, so last decade, kept 1.4 to 2.4 million low and moderate income um, students that were qualified for college from graduating. That's a lot of students that if we can lower it in some way, I don't, it would just be awesome to be, pull some of them back in. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit of how we um, began to implement OER here at ESU. Um, our dean, Dr. Shaw, right here, he is um, part of the reason why we started. He let us know that the university was interested in implementing OER, and he asked me, Megan, who's not here, and Kelly, if we would start a little team to kind of do some research about how we could start it here at ESU. So again, we did a ton of research. Um, we did a lot of reading, found some really good articles. Um, we met probably, I don't know, once every couple of weeks, all as a group, to uh, discuss what we found about OER. Um, we talked about copyright. We talked about Creative Commons licensing. Uh, we did a lot of professional development. Um, because OER is uh, generally free or low cost, any of the professional development opportunities to learn about OER are also free or low cost. Um, I think, which one did you go to, Kelly? Um, I did an implementing OER at your school. So they just taught different schools. It was an online seminar, which was really awesome. And they would um, all talk about their schools and what works for them. And it was like giving ideas back and forth. And then we would implement and give our, like, we had, I think it was an introduction to faculty, the new faculty that come in. This is a session that we would do with them. And so we got, we were able to give feedback. And Megan, who's not here, was able to go to a conference, uh, I believe it was in Niagara Falls, and mm -hmm. she learned about a whole bunch of other things that she could bring back and implement here. Um, and again, uh, some of us were taking workshops and courses that were on uh, OER as well. So it gave us a kind of a good idea what other schools were doing, and then we used that to kind of brainstorm how we could do that here at ESU. So each school is kind of different how they do it, but um, there were things that we could like cherry pick and definitely use here that would work. Yeah, so getting together and talking with each other was really helpful. Yeah, um, and we still and meet every few weeks. We do. So then I think on the next slide there was information about like the people who were already using. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the next thing we needed to do after we got our little core team together was try to grow our OER brand. So we tried to reach out across the campus and find other people on campus who were um, advocates for using OER um, or people who are already using it in their classroom. So here we have some additional team members. We actually have uh, Joe Acob from the bookstore who was really helpful for us. And most people think that, oh, you know, the bookstore is not really going to be very helpful for us because they want to sell textbooks. But they have um, a couple of options of low cost or um, free, is it, or just low cost? No, it's low cost. It's just low and cost. And I'll talk about it in a few minutes. Okay, so they, they actually have a lot of low cost options for students, so we're trying to get the word out there more that this stuff is there, so you don't necessarily have to spend all this money on a textbook, but um, that uh, partnership was really good to get started. Um, and then we have other faculty advocates, adopters, and promoters on this side. This is probably not a whole list. This is just who we could identify to, yeah. at the moment. So if you are a faculty member here tonight and you think you're using OER or you know you're using OER, we want to put you on the list. So then we can use you to help gain more momentum. Yeah. And what's really awesome about this whole process is we started off, I think it was last spring, uh, last fall, with like two or three weeks left of the semester and we wanted to start this initiative. And you have to know you're passionate about it because we were all like, let's attack the professors and be like, are you going to use this? Are you going to use this? So we did our <laughs> best to go and hunt down professors and talk to them. So everybody was really passionate about the project and it was really awesome because faculty was really uh, passionate about the project. We, haven't, we didn't have people that were like, oh, no way. We had people that were like, oh, let's, what is it? Let's talk about it. Like, yep. do you have any examples? Here, so yeah, we had one who was like, oh, here's what I'm using. Could this be considered OER? Oh, yeah, yeah, you'll yeah. put you on the list. So, exactly. Yeah, it was fun. Um, and another thing that's really nice about this whole process is we've had a lot of support from people of all different levels. Like our dean brought us in and he was super excited about this initiative. And the provost sent me to one of the conferences and that they've talked about it at the President's Council. So we, everybody knows it's a really important issue and they're all behind this. So it's always great when you know you have that kind of support behind you. Um, so the bookstore, talking about them, when we initially uh, started talking about 
who we were going to bring together and who we wanted to be involved in this. We really wanted to make this an interdisciplinary project and have people from any areas that we could. But we were kind of like, well, the bookstore is Barnes and Nobles and it's for profit. And we're trying to push a free textbook and put them out of a job. <laughs> so how are they going to be on board for this? But they were so supportive because they also have something called LoudCloud. Has anybody heard of LoudCloud or does anybody use it in your classes? No? Okay, well this is great. You could bring your, tell your professors. Um, it is a platform that has low cost, so it's $25 for the semester for one student. And it has a lot of gen ed courses. So you're, um, I think I have a list of some of them here. Biology, public speaking, uh, principles of management, introduction to psychology, things that you, you know, might take at a gen ed level. And the fac faculty, you, buy, you sign up for this, students can go into the bookstore, they can buy this loud cloud code, you go on, it has test banks, it has tests set up on loud cloud, it's a whole like CMS in itself. And what's nice is we can integrate it into D2L. So I understand that it's for sale, but it's a lot cheaper than $250. And it just gives us more options because even though OER is a great concept, it's still new, it's expanding so much. But to have this extra option to go to, and maybe you're not quite sure you want to use an OER, this is a great way to like kind of go into the baby pool and say, OK, <laughs> let me try this out. Let's see how this works. So it was really exciting to have um, them kind of on our side and work with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. $25 to one subject or $25 to all those subjects you mentioned? I'm, it's one subject, right? Yeah, yeah one to subject. one subject. Yeah. Okay. But if you're taking four classes, that's, that's a hundred bucks for it. Okay. Yeah, that's way. It's still less than 250 a book. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. And it's yeah. really nice for the faculty because I know that a big concern about faculty textbooks is test banks, it's the PowerPoints, it's the faculty resources that come with your textbooks, and this offers that. So it's really nice that way. Do you want to go um, on and show them? Yeah, sure. Or do you want me to do it? You doesn't matter. Okay. This clicker doesn't work, so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, since I am the electronic resources librarian, I thought it would be great to um, come up with a way to share um, information about OER on the library website. So I had an intern this year from uh, Rutgers University, and she's also a library student. So I had her help me create um, a web page and a libguide, which is basically a subject guide that we have on the library website um, for all different kinds of topics. We have subject guides for each one of uh, you know, your classes, some of your majors, and then we also have um, our OER libguide. So I'm just gonna quickly show you our OER libguide. And this is great because if tonight you go home and you're like, I want to implement this, but I forgot what everybody <laughs> talked about. This will give you all the information. Yes. So um, I can show you quickly how to get to this uh, LibGuide from the library website. And they literally just switched over our website to the new design like today. So it's a little weird looking if you've been on it before, but everything is still here. It's just slightly um, more redesigned. So um, if you go here to LibGuides, and then everything is in alphabetical order. Here's open educational resources. So you can find it here. So um, on the home page, it tells you what, e uh, what OER is, um, some myths and facts about OER. Um, why should you use OER? We've got lots of videos on how to do it. We have a pro con list. Um, how to open textbooks compared to traditional textbooks. And then implementation at ESU, pretty much what all we're talking about here today. You can go back and reread it. Um, using OER in your classroom, we have a lot of resources here about how other places have implemented OER. Um, SUNY, which is the State University of New York system, is really into um, creating OER. And I know that they, they give their professors a lot of time and money to create their own course materials. And if you are a professor looking for course materials, SUNY would be a great place to start. Um, I think on the next slide, you're going to talk about where you can find their repository of all of their OER materials, which is freely available to use for you. So um, again, where do you find OER? Um, there's a lot of different places you can find it. Um, open textbooks, uh, open textbook library. Here's the open SUNY textbooks. 
So you can go in there and browse around, look at the content, see if anything there is worth um, using for your class. Um, OER by subject. And I believe these were picked out of some of these repositories. That's a good, I will yeah. send up that. No <laughs> communication? Yeah. Is there humanities? Yeah, maybe grouped differently. We'll put that in there. <laughs> okay. I'm making a mental note. Um, so here's sort of what I was talking about before, using library resources as OER or alternative educational resources. We have, you know, millions of articles, books, journals, videos that you can use from the library in your courses. So if you need help and you want to put some of these in your courses, please ask us. Um, we have a whole section on copyright here too because that is kind of a concern with open educational resources. Um, and it can our like really go-to person on copyright. She knows Megan everything. Megan is better at this. Because yes. not everything, even though it's OER, can be reu like reused in certain ways. You can't edit everything, so there's different copyrights on different things, and she yeah. can walk you through which is which. Yeah, and it can get kind of confusing. I have that's like one of the biggest questions I get whenever I go somewhere. They're like, oh, can I use this book or this image in this way for my courses? And I'm like, well, <laughs> it can get kind of murky. Um, so this chart kind of gives you a little bit of a, an overview of how you can do this. If it's um, Disney, the answer is no. Right. <laughs> but this is a, a way that OER is also helping. So if you know it's open access, you know it's free, you know you can use it for anything, you don't have to worry about somebody coming to you, a publisher coming to you, you know, sometime in the future and saying, hey, you used my picture in your PowerPoint and now you owe us $300 for use of that picture. Which, is, which happens. Yeah. Um, and then we have just a whole section on the things that we read. So there's articles here, there's news stories. Um, we have a whole Twitter feed from OER Commons, so you can read OER information to your heart's content on the LibGuide. Um, and again, I think if we go back to the home here, I have, here is our contact information. So if you have any questions about OER, comments, um, good, bad, ugly. Suggestions. You can, uh, suggestions. You can email us at oer at esu.edu and I, one of us will get back to you. Um, you can email Megan, call Megan, uh, call me or Kelly and any of us can answer your questions. So again, this is on the uh, Kemp Library website under, oops, I went to the wrong one, under LibGuides and then O for Open Educational Resources. Okay, well, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. And again, we have a lot of that information copied onto the actual library website, so you can go there too. But I kind of like the LibGuide a little bit better. It's a little bit more user friendly to find everything on there. So there's a lot of places that you can actually find OERs and um, one of the reasons we'll talk about at the end if you're interested in implementing this in your class, how you can go about doing it. But um, we also on the LibGuide where we showed you where you can find them. So I'm just going to go through real quick and show you how easy it is. So this is OpenStax. This is uh, started at Rice University by a professor and it's uh, kept up by them. The nice thing is a lot of these places, you might feel like one of the concerns of a lot of faculty is, well, it, it's not peer reviewed. I don't have a publisher going through this, but a lot, I think most now are peer reviewed. And if you go to the about, if you actually scroll down, I think if you go to subjects, somewhere here, it actually says it's peer reviewed. So a lot of the places now in their about section will tell you if they're peer reviewed, what the process is. Now a lot of sites have ratings on their books, so you can go through and you can see um, how this book did. And if you use it in your classes, you can rate it yourself. So that's kind of nice. I think uh, Open Text. Book Network has the ratings. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go to social sciences. Oh, there it is. Um, so you'll see peer reviewed, it'll tell you the license. And then if you scroll down, let's say you're teaching an American government class, you click on this. What's nice is this gives you details, what the table of contents will look like, how you can view it online, what it's going to look like for your students online, 
how to download a PDF, because if you download a PDF, you can then contact me if you need help, and we can put it onto D2L so the students have access before the first day of class. Um, you can also order a print. Go ahead. So my question would be, um, which one would be safer? Like, download it and put it on the uh, D2L, mm -hmm. or just put the link there so the students can link and download it? I would say do both. Because you download it, then it's there, and then you have the backup link. So there are nothing saying, okay. What, okay. where is it? <laughs> okay. Or you could put they one in the always news. always find the reason. <laughs> <to say. laughs> That's why you put both. Um, but you could also uh, just send them to this website, because even though there's instructor resources, which I'll show you, you have to sign up. And when you sign up, you, you uh, have a link to your name somewhere saying you're a faculty member, so they can't g get that information. You know what I mean? That's so, so nice. And they have an email and a phone number to your office. So they're going to verify that you're actually a faculty member and you're not a student trying to get that. Um, so it has all this information. And then under instructor resources, you'll see what they do and don't have. So they have things here like PowerPoint slides, syllabus language, answer guides. They actually have Canvas in this. It depends on who, but some people have different ones, Blackboard, D2L. So they might have course ca uh, cartridges that you can use. If we go back one. So Carol, what is the, I'm just so super curious at this point. <laughs> so what is the motivation for professors <laughs> like these to have this open material? Other than helping students to save money, is there any other motivation? Uh, well, it's mostly helping students, but. For sure. It's your own, it's convenient if you find okay. something. But why do they open it to other universities? Um, you mean like why did Rice University yeah. open it? I think it's just good, it looks, it looks good for the university. So okay. now they have uh, collaboration between different universities and now everybody's going to Rice University. You know what I mean, rather than. So they contribute to the textbook online to enrich the content? Does Rice University? Yeah. Um, I don't know the specific on this one. Go ahead. Well, there are several universities around the country that have already uh, made contributions to uh, open textbooks. Professors are encouraged uh, you know, from all universities, but those universities are the universities that have already created a platform to publish those open textbooks. Okay. So uh, professors from all uh, different universities have uh, created open textbooks for several reasons. First, to save money for students, and the second, uh, unlimited link. You don't have any problem if I have a link, link problem. And third, you know, those textbooks are available immediately. Anytime when you have started a class, <coughs> class and then you have textbook. Mm -hmm. So uh, talking about this, uh, I'm sorry. No, just, that's okay. I have a couple <laughs> of words for students. There are so many textbooks that are created free, freely online. <coughs> so they are available online, they are in high quality. So I just want to encourage you to talk to your professors, to ask them to use, to <coughs> evaluate these textbooks, to see if they can use some of these textbooks as the class, their class textbooks. That way, we will save your money. They are a couple of issues. First, how to find this textbook? If your professors have this kind of question, they can always contact them. Uh, and the second, uh, the question about the quality of textbook, of course, they, they need to spend time to evaluate this textbook. So we need your help to talk to your professors, to push them. Some of them may know, some of them may not know the existence of te open textbook. But if you, if you can bring this message to them, that will help us. I think another benefit, too, is a lot of professors, they have a book they like. And they use it every time that a new edition comes out. And it's easy to do that. And these are just as good. They're peer reviewed. I really like how this website has it like right, like yeah, right well. big letters, right? Right up at the top. So you don't have to guess that this is peer reviewed. It's all open access. It's all free. Go ahead and use it. Um, a lot of professors, too, say, well, I don't want to change my textbook because it takes so much work yeah. to get all the course materials and get my PowerPoints done and all that. Sure. 
a lot of these open access already have that done for you. So you've just saved yourself all that extra time. So that's one benefit. Two is you've saved yourself some time there um, to not having to create all of that yeah. on your own. It's true and not true because right. uh, from a professor's <laughs> point of view, when you chose, uh, when the professor chose a new textbook, it still takes time for oh, yeah. to adapt to it. Definitely. And then every professor, when they use a textbook, they don't necessarily use it all 100%. Right. They do some um, modification, they add stuff they right. have created. Right. So, yeah, it's, uh, I fully uh, understand um, your message and uh, encouraging professors to use those, it's a good idea, mm -hmm. but uh, probably will take time. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's, so like it's like a, I'm, I'm s persuading myself. For right. Yeah. I do see the I do see the advantages here. Yeah. And what's yeah. nice for like the college or the institution like sponsoring things is like Jeff Ruth is on sabbatical right now writing a Spanish textbook that's interactive that's really awesome and that's not been done before. So he's going to be like leading that edge of the Spanish textbooks and people are going to be like oh he's that ESU professor so it puts our name also yeah. out there that's well. So that's another thing is that I myself is uh, developing material for over the time over the years teaching same courses over the years. So when I uh, uh, chose one of those, so how I'm gonna fit what I have already developed into what. Available here. Some of them are That's actually editable, really so you can actually insert your own like stuff. Into yeah. It, yeah. Well, okay. I, I, you know, for professors, I I think I have to add that uh, the large majority of open textbooks are customized. Oh, okay. So you can either uh, you can either insert your own material into uh, the existing textbooks. Or you can uh, uh, modify their, their, their materials. Okay. They're free. Jim? Yeah, I was going to say um, I usually use the database sources mm -hmm. that we have. Because what my motivation is, it's already there. Mm. Like, you know, if some, something is already there, why not use it? And then um, the second one is I don't want to deal with the textbook problems that the students are buying or not. Like, that is actually my real motivation because. I know that they don't buy it sometimes, but if it's there, they cannot necessarily say, yeah. I don't have my textbook. Or they're buying it off of Amazon and it's or, taking yeah. two weeks. Yes, and then especially for online courses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know at my, my previous job, one of the problems when the, uh, it was a new school and people were developing their coursework, and one of the problems was they, some people were not understanding the difference between Creative Commons, copyright, uh, stuff you can use in your course packs and we for a while as librarians we were going through and like okay where'd you find that picture or where'd you find that graph and telling them like oh no you can't use that in that way because that like we don't we don't purchase that we don't know where that come from so with something like this you have no questions like oh yeah I can use that chart I can use that picture I can you know put that in my D2L page and have the students use it with no worry about like I said um, a publisher or somebody else who has a copyright on it coming to you and saying, well, now you've got to take that out yeah. because, And what's yeah. nice is if you ever go to <laughs> OER like presentations, most of the people in the OER community are pretty open to having them use. So if you have a question about copyright on the presentation, just email them and they'll be like, yeah, sure, use yeah, it most, most of the time. Yeah, most of the time, time too, I, a lot of things, if you just contact the people and say, hey, can I use this? They're like, yeah, sure. They just don't want you using it without letting yeah. them know. <laughs> Um, so here's just a macroeconomics book, and if you go under instructional resources, here's a test bank, because I know that's like always a question, because Pearson, um, you know, and those other Sage has the test bank. So this is here, ready for you guys to use too. So the test bank is instructor accessible only. Yeah, they're gonna verify that it's actually you. Okay. Which is nice, because you don't want. Don't share your password. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> so how That's one verify? thing that you can't control is the password sharing. Um, <laughs> it takes three to four days. They look at the website to make sure that that's you, and you give them their office phone number so and your email. So they contact you email. I think they call you. So if I get onto this, your website at the Camp Library, mm -hmm. I could do a search to 
to find out the, what textbooks are available on communication? Um, what, Nash, Nash, I mean, what any worldwide. sources? Yeah. Yes, if you went on the LibGuide where it says find resources, okay, you can search through these repositories and whatever else we have there, and, and you can go through yourself. And any any research you ever do for your for your subject, and you see like a really good article, you could use that too. Oh, okay, so, so all of those. Mm -hmm. Since I know when I went to grad school, I only had to buy one textbook. Most of my professors had us read like chapters that they had downloaded from somewhere or um, like the latest research in a peer-reviewed article they would say here's the link to it read it and I think yeah. I, I think I only bought one book all through grad school because certain certain disciplines are they don't want a three or four year old textbook <coughs> they want the latest research so you know maybe like nursing library science yeah is anybody <laughs> in here nursing science Kay, yeah you know your people. textbooks are super expensive you know what yeah. I mean? And then, so if you can save your students money by giving them an open textbook or links to articles that the library already has or links to ebooks that the library already has, and that would definitely be a good thing. And sometimes it's not even like just you subbing a textbook. Like I know for nursing, I talked to somebody, I have to find this information, but there was um, online sims that were OER and people were just giving each other sim ideas. So like even something in your, feel that you think we wouldn't have, contact us and we'll look into it and we'll see. I have stuff pop up in my, uh, my Facebook news feed all the time and I think it's because I've been searching for this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the last couple of weeks I've found a free collection of like 500 art textbooks. So I sent that to Liz and I think she put it up on the art libguide. So if you're a professor and you're looking to supplement or use a collection like that for your classes, You've just saved your students a whole ton of money. They don't have to buy these specialized textbooks. Um, and I also sent her a link I found to paintings. So instead of making students buy another art textbook that has paintings in it or whatever, you can send them to this website where they can see high quality images of, of paintings. So it could really be anything that's freely available yeah. um, that you can use for your courses. Um, so some of our strategies that we use, so after we got our team together and everything, you know, kind of in focus and we got some professors, uh, outreach is a big thing, you know, outreach is for everything. So some of our strategies that we did, and I'll talk about in the next slide, um, is the actual week, but um, the drop-in sessions, I don't know if, does anybody go to the site lunches? They're really great. We hosted a site lunch. We had the flyers, uh, didn't you go door-to-door? -door? Yes. Yeah. Um, flyers and I walked <coughs> around campus to certain departments and I knocked on professors doors and went in and say hey do you know about OER and handed them a flyer and said if you need any help ask us well you can uh, answer your questions and it went over fairly well um, but I need to definitely go out and walk more on campus to get the message out more in spring yep, in <laughs> the spring, cold now, now. Um, cold. we sent out some emails uh, we have did some webinars, and there's a lot, if you're interested and you still want more information, a lot of webinars that we can even find you on OERs that are typically free. And I think some of the, the LibGuide stuff that she showed you is actually uh, courses, too. Mm -hmm. So one fun thing that we thought, and uh, I, I think you had the idea of this, was we first decided that something we needed to kind of bind OER at ESU together was a logo. So we... Uh, contacted Dave Mazur, and he works with New Mind Design. And I strongly believe that if you can incorporate students into the learning process, that's really the best way to go. So he got his um, students, and they, they were gonna make a logo for us. So we went in, we interviewed, this is what OER is a little bit about. They originally created, I think, 10, 10 or 12. Yeah, we narrowed it to four. Yeah, we worked as a group and narrowed it to three or four. And then we decided, and this is what was your idea, that it would be a cool outreach idea to send out uh, an email and put it on a LibGuide and have people vote. So we had people vote, and this is what we came up with for our um, logo. So we're going to start, we're waiting on the, uh, the final, like the JPEGs and the very final stuff. But this is what's going to be on our paperwork from now on, all of our OER, you know, emails, flyers, things like that. So that's the logo. We were really excited about that. There was a lot of there was actually a lot of cool logos. They did like an awesome pick. job. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks to them. 
Um, so here's just some examples of our flyers that we sent out. This is one of the first ones that we sent out. It's OER Get Started Today. So it's just some information to faculty about uh, different like our URL, like how it's supportive, how it saves stu students money, um, how it can like, you know, appeal to your, make your course appealing. So here's some, uh, I think we have, do we have this on the LibGuide too? I think there. I think we have all of this on the LibGuide. Yeah, yeah. Those are a couple of flyers that we came up with too. Like, um, I think Kelly, we we did a couple of um, events during, um, we called it OER week. Yeah. So we planned um, several events during a week in March to let people know about what OER is and how they could implement it in their classes. So again, it was site lunches. We did a couple of sessions in, um, in Stroud, mm -hmm. in Stroud 404 and 405. In the site, the site room. In, yep, and then I think we also did a couple of other um, drop-in sessions and other spots on campus. So we did that, and then the other, the other half of that page was basically like more detail from that other flyer, so why you should use it, um, uh, and how we're implementing it. Yeah, and um, the thing is, the, so with OER week la last year, we're going to do it again this year. But there's something called Open Educational Week, and you can actually go to openeducationalweek.org. And it is this year from March 4th through the 8th. So what they do is their whole goal is just to promote open educational resources. Um, and they post tons of events and tons of free things online. And you can sign up the school for, the, like, we're hosting a webinar or we're doing, you know, a session on this. And it's really awesome. So this year we're hoping to kind of um, take our OER week and merge it with like the same time frame of there. It's the week before spring break, so it'll end off with a bang. Um, and it's just cool. We do like the. I don't. Did anybody up, um, go to the site lunch last year with OER during OER week? No. It's just we were able to talk like one on one with people. Like, what's your concerns? You know, do you have a textbook? Yeah. You sit and you eat lunch and you just kind of talk with people informally about what they're doing. And that, I think that was kind of like a less scary way to yeah. kind of talk about it. Yeah. It was fun. Everybody, the site lunches are awesome if you haven't been able to go to them. And they're only $5. <laughs> okay, so this is, <laughs> Kelly okay. found this um, infographic too about how to, um, some people think it's difficult to publish an OER textbook or create <laughs> OER material. So if you want to explain what's on one end, so this is a super hard end, and it's things like time travel, an empirical proof of God existence, <laughs> <laughs> teleportation, and then at that end, totally doable, is publishing an ebook. Things like it's even easier than getting your PhD. So it's the super easy part of OER. And if you're interested, we're going to talk about how you can get into OER, but like you could contact any of us, you could talk to, we'll put you in touch with other professors who have used OER, or like Jeff Ruth, he's a good contact because he's done it. So this yeah, is my. He's recommending I should turn my textbook into OER. Do See? It. It's a good, I think it's a I want to do it. It's easier than yeah, a mission. You're going to be more even excited when we see how much we've saved students. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And it's easier than ta and taking a And save me a lot of work, too. Yeah. I mean, in the long run. Yeah. yeah. In the long run. Yeah, exactly. Um, so now, if you're interested in OER, where do you go? So I talked a little bit about um, how to find resources. So again, you could go right to the library website, um, go to the OER LibGuide, and um, we can help you adapt anything you want into your coursework as OER. Um, I think we have a more specific copyright libguide you can look at too so if yeah. you want you have any questions about course materials that way um, if you need help adapting it to your class um, any of us and Dr. Shaw you two here can answer questions about um, specific subjects yeah what's really kind of nice is that I think was this I think this semester at the at the beginning we were looking at some of the things that we wanted to accomplish and we wanted to accomplish a workflow to what happens like if a uh, if Wenji comes up to me and says, I want to do this, how do I do this? Like, what, what do we say? Just like, I, okay. So we came up with OER. Let's sit down and do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's OE, OER at ESU.edu. So you yeah, can, I right. mean, you can contact any of us, but if you contact that email, Megan's going to get it. She's going to look at it and she's going to say, who do I send it to? Because it might be a copyright issue, it might be an IT issue, it might be a, 
a specific subject that you need help with. So she's going to, all the subject librarians are going to be trained in this so they can go to, okay, this goes to Megan because right. this goes to Liz because it's art. This goes to Education Allison. So they'll know that. And that then, documents, Michelle. yeah, yeah. <laughs> If it's a D2L or any kind of technology question, then she'll to forward it to me. So I've already had like two professors I've helped this semester. Just when the textbook, I think one of them was a link that wasn't working because it was the wrong link. So they pushed on the textbook and it wasn't first day accessible because they were like, it's not working. So I just helped fix that. Do you have a question? question. Yeah. All right. So if, for the, um, the databases, the um, ebook databases that we have right now. So. Um, I realize that eBook Central is not accessible from off campus. I'm working on that. <coughs> okay. <laughs> that's okay. a big. That's a um, a bigger problem, which okay. I'll tell you about later. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, if if you have I any eBooks that you notice that you can you might want to use for your class, you could ha you could use those if okay. you wanted. Yeah. So we kind of made that work. Uh, flow just so we would know what happens when a professor comes up to us and says, hey, I need this. Can we take a look at um, some of those professors you just listed before? Yeah. They mm -hmm. have been using OER. I don't know how that's so tempted <laughs> to say OED or something. <laughs> OCD. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Can you show us, show me at least some examples of what they are doing? I'll, I'll, I'll show you. Well, I don't have their. Other than my colleague, okay. <laughs> just pick someone else there. I don't have my. Um, I don't know exactly. Is there any of their stuff open? We can access. Janet Miss Michigan. It's a textbook. Um, I don't know where she got it from, but it's a PDF that we posted to D2L. Okay. I know I don't have Robert Cohen on here, but he uh, in physics, he uh, wrote his. Their department has their own physics textbook. So. Wow. Yeah, and if you go, I think I mentioned this before, but the bookstore will print any ebooks at a, uh, a discount. <laughs> so I think it's like 40 bucks for like a big tech, uh, printed book. So even if you're afraid of using ebooks, we can have printed versions. Um, do you know any, the, any, some of the professors are using different versions, no, but they're I, all I pretty much. personally, but I don't know what they're doing with ebook. So well, I, you should invite them to a site lunch, oh, <laughs> sure. and then you can talk to them about. Oh yeah, and I'll be there <laughs> for questions. That's a really good idea, actually. So, Jeb, what have, have you been doing? Come and demo it. With, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you now. Okay, Jeb is going to show me. Good okay. Idea. <laughs> so, does anybody have any idea how much we've saved students? Anybody guess? Guess. How much have we saved students this year already? Well, I'm just going to say I am a student, and I'm taking six courses. Oh, oh nice. Most people no. have gym for three classes. And okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you saved a little bit of money yeah, from so doing that. Instead of me spending like maybe like six hundred dollars on textbooks this semester, I spent two hundred. Okay. Wow. We're thinking, think big, like overall, how much have we saved students? The whole semester? ESU. Yes. All together. Well, he saved the three hundred times uh, mm. six thousand students. No, so Oh, yeah, no. we, only have, we only have Let those five or six professors six that are using OER. Let me get my calculator. <laughs> Your number was a little bit That's high. OER too. Your number was slightly high, but... But this is how much we've saved so far. So over $100,000 we've saved students. Wow. And that's a lot of, you know, things that they can do. They can have... This is a very conservative yeah. estimate. Yes, because that doesn't even include the OER textbook collection that we have. Right, and we don't, we don't know. Okay. Um, if there are other people who are doing the same thing, they might not consider it OER, so we're trying to find those people. And Megan actually uh, compiled all the information with the, with the costs in it okay. in a spreadsheet and then found this out. Wow. Yeah, she so. went and saw what textbook you were using previously. I she, I think, estimated $100. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw yours and I was like, where's the textbook? So we're, that, I think, was really exciting for the first semester and I think it can only increase that way. Um, so that's awesome. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, so, but if you started this just year, started, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Wenji, if you write your own textbook, that number. <laughs> well, I teach four classes, right? Usually three preps, so you can calculate. You yeah. Know, it's a lot of money. Yeah. So thirty times four. <laughs> <laughs> So our, just our final, 
recommendations or if you have any, any questions whatsoever, any comment, suggestion, nothing's too small to reach out to one of us. N or O E R at ESU.edu. I need $600. There you go. Per semester I could save. Oh my gosh. $9,600. So does anybody have any questions? Any concerns? I see a hand here. Yes. So I might have missed this. I've heard about this in the context of being in any course or in class. Is there any way for a student to just access a textbook without being in a course? Good. So let's say I just want to read a macro economic textbook. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. I just, no, yeah. That's a piece. yeah, you can actually, the one that I showed you, that is you, that's accessible. So the only thing that's not accessible to you is um, the faculty resources. Like the test banks and things like that. And then if you're interested in something like that, I would also look into MOOCs that are free. Because MOOCs um, are kind of like an extension. I Same family OER. And they usually have like reading material and those kind of courses that are free. Okay, so yeah. these are like you're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah? Our Zoom Foundation. Okay. Don't really do well with OER or <coughs> so there might be lots of stuff uh, in the like, like this, this is a direct but link to the library that that they don't have okay. a lot of. There they go there. Yeah, 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 this is I don't really think so because even if you look at the sciences, the intro classes are gonna always have like physics is the same, pretty much, you know what I mean? Like the the general information everywhere. You know, your humanities or your like uh, the digital arts. You might be looking at uh, Lydia, Linda, Linda videos, so it's um, or like YouTube videos, so it's like might d d differ on how those materials are created or how those courses are delivered. But there should be something, at least on a basic level, for all types of disciplines. And it's really interesting because some universities have gone so far as creating whole. Um, uh, not colleges, but you know, subjects that are OER like, so you can receive a um, instructional technology masters that's all OER. Obviously, we're not there, and, and that might not work because upper level courses, but you can go to a university and say, This is all OER. I'm never going to have to pay for a textbook in my career. So, we're hoping at least for our long term goal yeah. is gen eds <laughs> here that nobody buys textbooks for one day. And again, uh, for students, because I uh, many of your students, uh, when you uh, when you talk you, to your professors, it is quite possible that uh, a specific course that may not have OER textbooks available. Because I, I I don't I don't know the exact number. I think uh, uh, for uh, general uh, education courses, the majority of them have uh, open textbooks. But there are courses that are that do not have. Okay, in case. You talk to your professor, ask your professor to save your money, and there's no open textbooks available. Mm -hmm. Talk to us. The library has money to buy the textbooks that are not available open access. Therefore, we have the, the copy or the hard copy available in the library for you to use. You can go to go to the library. You know, uh, we may not allow you to uh, check it out because you know we only buy one textbook. Uh, for one class, but you can go there to study. So please, please talk to your professor. Yeah, and even if you think maybe, oh, my course is like super unique. I had a professor ask, uh, he's teaching violence in America, and he asked for help last semester, and we found stuff that would pertain to his course. So there's stuff out there for everything. So what is um, a textbook publisher strategy now? Things. The game seems to have been redefined. Oh, so what are they doing now? They're stressed, I think. <laughs> really? I know I'm just that curious if about you, the whole So like, let's say you, let's just use Pearson as an example. And you have a Pearson book, okay. and you say, oh, no, I'm using OER. I, I definitely noticed that the, the reps don't visit me as often as before anymore. They'll cut your price down. They'll say, if you come back to our book, I'll oh, cut it down. Oh, so I can off. negotiate now. That's you what can I've heard. Negotiate. Okay. Yeah, stories. Oh, I never know. <laughs> and that. they're starting that, like, that's why Barnes and Nobles get on on Loud Cloud, because at least it's $25 a student. They can develop courses, and they're making some money, because yeah. it's, I mean, it might not be in every single college and yeah. every course, but it's definitely a big part of can, universities now. Yeah, and I can tell you with databases, I didn't know this until I became a librarian, that if they really want your business enough, you can negotiate a very good price with them. 
Wow. Because they, they want your business. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, don't so be I afraid to a, negotiate. I, I, so I have a very specific question mm -hmm. or problem. Maybe you can help me to okay, yeah. solve it. <laughs> For what class I will be teaching next semester, I have already identified a textbook. Uh -huh. However, it's already out of print. Mm. Uh, but I do have a copy of the textbook. So can I give it to you? And you upload it on your website so my student can access it? Probably, not the, so whole, probably not the whole book. <coughs> not the whole book? No. I think it's 10%, right? There's a certain amount you can do uh, to put on reserve. So I think oh. it's like, it might well, be 10 or 20% of the copyright. The yeah. yeah. So I have to show you the test book yes. and you but will. But if not, then you can always put it on reserve. Uh -huh. Well, one, one of the things that I realized that, for example, there's a, um, the, with the EBSCO book, okay. um, that we have, um, most of the books available there are university publishing houses, <coughs> yeah. so, you know, yeah. I think much more university uh, presses are going to actually utilize this. So th th those are nice publications as well. So. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So I will show you the book, maybe we can talk more about it. Yeah. yeah. I had grad students at the medical school, they'd come up to me and say, if I gave you like this book, can you like put it up for me? And I'm like, no. <laughs> well, I can find it somewhere else. And I'm like, don't tell me that. So don't maybe, tell me. <laughs> maybe it, it is already electronically available somewhere else. Yeah, maybe that could be. Maybe should say it's a, it's a but yeah, maybe okay. students just have to pay a fee yeah. to access. Maybe, yeah. yeah. It all depends on the copyright of the book, so. Yeah. All right. Thank you.